Thank you for a wonderful Dharma talk. Um, yeah, so that first vow, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. And Steve, I love your answer. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the question is, how can we save all sentient beings? And, you know, Steve's answer, we do it together. You know, we don't do it just by ourselves. We do it together. We are the many hands and many eyes of Avalokiteshvara. And that's a wonderful answer because it opens it up. Instead of closing it down, like, you know, Steve mentioned this alternative answer of saying, oh, all beings are already one, so there's nobody to save. You know, that's, that's, I mean, in some sense, that's true. But given that way, it becomes like a thinking answer. Okay, check it off, check it off, check it off. You know, we, we're done with that question. But that's a wonderful question. You know, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. How can we save all sentient beings? And there's many, many ways to answer it. You know, there's the one where the, the, the two kids are walking along, you know, the shoreline and there are all these, um, there are all these starfish that have been thrown onto the beach. And of course they're dying because they need to be in the water. And, and this, the girl says, oh, we've got to save the starfish. And the boy says, oh, there's too many of them. And she says, well, I can save this one and I can save this one. And that's another answer to it. And there are many, many answers. The best answer, but any answer that closes it off where you think, okay, I don't have to think about that. I mean, that's not a good answer. But I like your answer, Steve, because it opens it up. Oh, yeah, I've got to do this. I've got to do the work, you know. And I had the same question when I first started practice. And um, I asked Diane Eagles, who's now a teacher. She took even longer than I did to become a teacher. I think it was like 40 years or something because um, she left for a while. Um, but, you know, she was, she'd been practicing for a while and she's just wonderful. Those of you who, who, who met her, whether in person or online, know how wonderful she is. And, and she's a tiny woman. I mean, she's really tiny, she's much shorter than I am, not tall. And um, so I asked her, you know, after I've been practicing like for a few weeks, I said to her, you know, how, how do you save all sentient beings? And she stood on her tippy tippy toes and pat me on the head and she said don't worry you'll get it <laughs> you know, it's answer like don't stop you know don't stop move forward you know this is your job you know don't check a box just do it you know so thank you for a really really wonderful talk that was really great and thank you for reminding us of this first topic we've never done with we're never done with it until all sentient beings. And I never heard this story about Avalokiteshvara, you know, and Amida Buddha giving him all these heads and arms. And he has an eye in each hand, by the way. So that's how he can see all these different creatures and stuff. Um, that's, a, that's a really wonderful story. Thank you. So are there any questions? Surely there has to be a question. I have a question. Okay. Um, so this um, last week, um, my uh, brothers and I cleaned out my uh, my parents' house. Um, they have both, both died, so we were finishing up the estate. And, um, you know, it was really, it was emotional and it was difficult. And, and you could see us all clinging to certain objects, you know, um, and uh, I kept telling myself, oh, it's just an object, you know, it isn't, it isn't the real thing, you know, it isn't, it isn't my mother or my grandmother or my father or my grandfather's, I mean, it's, it's just an object. Um, and it's, it's real um, confusing, because what do you do with, with things that, that, you know, other people that you love cherished and they're gone. And so do you, do you cherish the object? Do you, do you throw it away? Because you can't possibly keep everything, you know? Um, and so impermanence, we're supposed to look at the objects. It's, they're all going to, to not be around at some point. And I, I, I don't really have a, a real 
question question other than what are, what are your thoughts when it comes to you know the objects that in a way I felt like I was sometimes dismissing my mother because of things that she held on to that I didn't want to hold on to but yet she'd write us these notes you know this meant a lot to me and it's like well, I, you know, can we keep everything? And what if it breaks? Then does that, what does that do? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thoughts aren't important. Um, you said something very interesting. You said something about how we should think about them or how we should feel about them, how they're just objects. So nothing is just an object. Everything is part of this vast interconnected web, whether it's a so-called sentient being or a so-called non-sentient piece of paper with your mother's handwriting on it. Everything is infused with everything else. And what you do with it is up to you. So some people love to throw things out and some people love to hold on to things and most of us are kind of in the middle. And what works for you, you know? Is there like, um, is there like a totem that you look at it and you really want to have this around? Oh yeah, I remember this person, you know, I have this totem. You know, for my husband, his father's watch, it was very important that he have his father's watch after his father died. And um, I have my, I had, had two mothers, the first one died and then I had a stepmother for most of my life, so she's also my, my mother mother. Um, and I had both of their wedding rings. And, you know, what, what, it's, you know, your karma, what, what is meaningful, you know, not in the sense of meaning, but in the sense of what, you know, what opens your heart, what, you know, helps you connect, and then you decide. And of course, the difficulty is when two siblings want the same thing. <laughs> That's never fun. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, don't ever fall into what we should be thinking. Oh, we're supposed to do this, we're supposed to do that. You know, just look at it for what it is. You know, at my stage of life, I'm looking at these things that I've kept that mean something to me, and I think they don't mean anything to my son, you know. And um, a lot of people here, you know, don't have kids to hand things off to. And so it's like, what happens when I die? What's going to happen to this stuff? You know, don't worry about it. Just right now, right now, what's, what speaks? And you sometimes find your relationship to things change, you know, and uh, we had this thing where we had to um, pack everything up because we were going to have a lot of work done on our house. And a lot of stuff that we clung to over the years, we looked and we said, ah, we don't need this. You know, at the time we did, and then we don't. And it's just, it's just what it is. But don't try to interpose an idea of what you should be thinking and feeling with what you're actually thinking and feeling. And recognize that, you know, we, this, this really, this, this deep interconnectedness that we have with everything in the universe and it extends to things like, you know, I don't know, maybe a pair of earrings or maybe a pencil. <laughs> maybe maybe somebody's, you know, beloved person, you know, like to draw and there's this pencil, you know, and they really want to have that pencil, you know, whatever it is, you know, and just recognize it for what it is and that it's a sign of connection. You're, you're acknowledging a connection and you want that connection to continue 
And this is a, you know, a reminder of that. That's all. So thank you. And good luck. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I'd like to say that Liz's question and what Steve was talking about are not different. So this deep interconnectedness carries through for everything, every place, any time. And Avalokiteshvara's great vow to liberate all beings is exactly a recognition of this deep interconnectedness. And in the morning bell chant, um, no, yeah, um, yeah, in the morning bell chant, there's, um, there's these four lines which basically boil down to together with all beings we save all beings. So it's not just that each of us is trying together with other beings to save other beings, but it's like, it's all it's just kind of this big stew, you know, saving all beings. We are a being and all beings saving each other. You know, it's just this wonderful, rich stew. And it ends, the, these four lines end with um, self, other, one moment, attain Buddha. So at the same time, everybody becomes Buddha. It's this wonderful vision. And it's the same vision as recognizing that you look at this thing that, you know, belonged to your mother and it really means something to you. So it's this connection that's through time and space. It's, it's not, it's not, um, it's not limited. It's really infinite. So I just wanted to say that. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, probably a little less serious of a topic, but uh, um, if I'm reading a sutra mm -hmm. and I don't understand it, mm -hmm. should I just keep reading until the end? And then like, if I don't understand, just keep like reread it until I do, or should I think about it to, um, to under, understand what the, what the sutra is getting at. I love these should questions. There are no shoulds. You know, there's no should. Um, whatever helps you wake up. So a very long time ago when I met Zen Master Sung San and I was really hit with um, with the fact that I really knew nothing because I, I didn't get what was going on. You know, someone would ask him a question, you know, well, no, he would, he would ask, he'd hold up a glass of water and say, what, you know, is this a glass of water or is this not a glass of water? And then he put it down. And I think he didn't answer the question, you know? And he'd do things like that. You know, is this a watch or is this not a watch? You know, he'd just do all these things like that. And I was just like, I just, you know, I was just hit with the fact that nothing I knew was worth anything. I mean, it was, 
you know, you hear the, the phrase existential crisis. It really was like an existential crisis. I couldn't function. I couldn't drive myself home. I had to call a friend to come and get me because I was unable to function. It was just this, like somebody had stabbed me in the gut, you know, and, um, and I, so, and this lasted for days and, um, I mean, I looked like I could function, but you know, I, I was just in this state of, of real confusion, not in a good way. And, um, you know, I was just hit by don't know, but I didn't understand that's what was going on. And so I was just very confused about it. And, and I was taking, um, a class on you know, inter introduction to Zen class with, of all people, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, cause he was a student of Zen master Sung Sun at the time. And, um, so I went to the class and I told him what had happened. I said, I'm, I, I just don't know what to do. And he said, read Dogen. <laughs> so I went to the library and I got some, you know, Dogen Zenji, uh, this, this really amazing, the, the, the real founder of Soto Zen in, in Japan. I mean, Soto Zen is part of Kaodong school. And, but he, he was really the one who brought it together and an amazing philosopher. And I, and I picked up, you know, Dogen Zenji's book, and I, one, one of his many books, I don't remember which one, and I started reading it, and I, it didn't make no sense to me whatsoever. I mean, he's a very, very uh, difficult philosopher, sort of like Heidegger or Kant or something like that, and in much of what he writes, very difficult to read and very subtle of thought, and I couldn't make any sense of it, but somehow it calmed me down, you know? It just calmed me down. I don't know why. Something in the words that I absolutely did not understand just calmed me down and I was okay after that. And, you know, and I never picked up any works by Dogen Zenji again. <laughs> And maybe I will sometime. I have a whole bunch of them on my bookshelves. I mean, I have friends who write books about them, you know, and, and who translate them and stuff like that, but I haven't read them again. Um, and so where's the should in that? You know, should I have continued reading? Should I have, you know, castigated myself for not having a cognitive understanding of what was going on and try to puzzle it through? It just, that's what happened, you know? So take away the shoulds, take away the shoulds. And just look at, does this open me up? Does this open me to practice? Does this encourage me to practice? Does this open my eyes? Does this open my mind? And whatever does those things, whatever encourages your practice, strengthens your practice, opens your mind, you know, raises this big question, you know, doesn't shut things down with answers, but raises this big question. If anything that does that, go for it. And it doesn't do it, don't. It's that simple. You're the only one who knows. And at different stages of your life, different things will be appropriate. Yeah, I really should pick up Dogen Zenji again because now I like reading sutras and stuff like that and I get a lot out of it. Um, but yeah, but well, for many, many, for decades, I couldn't. I, I just didn't, for at least 10, 15 years, couldn't make sense of them. So, okay. So you find, you know, you, fi you find your way. No one can find your way. You have to find it. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then it's announcement time.